Welcome to Tao Living, the Art of Living podcast with your host, Lou Corletto, where you will be supported to remember that you are the driver and not the vehicle so that you can walk your life in trust. Welcome back to this episode of the Tao Living podcast, the Art of Living. And I'm once again, uh, super grateful to have my guest speaker, Dr. Gary Salyer with me. A few months ago, we did our first episode together and unpacked, well, we started to unpack because there's just so much in there, the beauty of his book, Safe to Love Again. And I, I shared with Gary before that when you first look at the title of the book, of course, because Gary's a relationship expert, among other things, and it looks like the book is around relationship it it is of course but it's so much more than that like for me it should be required reading for all educators required reading for all therapists of any kind uh, and healing practitioners to understand the processes that the mind body goes through when it has an experience uh, how it's recorded the stories that we create the meanings we give it uh, and the stories that he uses throughout the book to explain the points that he's making of why we do what we do to end up where we end up uh, is, is just spectacular. So uh, I'm grateful to have him on the on the show again, and we're going to unpack some more nuggets. Uh, so for uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't listened to that first episode, I'll have a link in there so you can go check that out because that was specifically about unpacking the essence of the book in the 10,000 foot view and some deep dive. We're now going to go deeper. Uh, and so if you wouldn't mind, Gary, like a five minute recap, like the, the four feelings, six rights, what they are and how they kind of reference the essence of the book. And then we're going to go deeper. Okay. So <clears throat> in my book, you know, I'm asking the question, I'm answering the question. How do you get secure attachment back? Now, what is attachment theory? Attachment theory is the science of how your brain got wired to love and be loved. And attachment theory basically says that people have four styles, ways, you know, flavors of loving. They're secure that are really good at choosing and creating and maintaining a good, loving relationship that feels good. Feelings are going to be real key here, okay? But if you had a childhood or something happened in adulthood where love was there, not there, love, not there, not there, you get a fight response. And how do I lock that down? When does love go away? How do I manage? How do I, you know, you know, and there's this anxiousness that wants to manage. It's hyper vigilant mm. and highly reactive. Or what if you just didn't get a whole lot of attention? You know, mom and dad were pretty much on their own and you learned I better be on my own, too. <clears throat> then you go and then you have a flight response. You, it's hard. The like, subconscious feeling is you can't depend on anybody. God, best deal is doing it by yourself. The Marlboro mate. <laughs> right. And so that's that's called avoidant. And they, they tend to be also dismissive. Of feelings, whereas the anxious are preoccupied with with their past pain. There's also a fourth group called disorganized. That's it's. it's you know, come hither, go away. They're afraid of losing love and they're afraid of having it in a very disorganized way. <clears throat> That's about 5% of the population. I asked the question, so if you were like me and you got either anxious or avoidant, how do you get back mm. brain that has all that good wiring that just naturally knows how to pick and create and maintain a good loving relationship? Because that's the gold standard. That's the holy grail, is to be wired like the masters, not the, what Gottman would call the disasters. And I literally had 22 of my clients ask me the same question one month. <clears throat> that kind of focalized the book. How, do, how Could you do an event that in one weekend, <laughs> which is not possible in one weekend, <laughs> by the way, the brain wouldn't want to move that fast, to get back secure love. And it focalized what I've been doing my work. How, you know, not really, that's what I'm doing. I'm getting people reclaim this. I'm not working on problems, not working just on relations. I'm really helping them rewrite the motherboard. And then my attention went back to this uh, very famous 
experiment called the strange situation. Mm. You can take a baby. And I went back. What is at the bottom? What is at the base of what's the very foundation of secure love? Well, we know that babies, eight, 10 months to 18 months, already have attachment styles that are already in place that early. Because if you separate from their mom, you can notice how they react when there's separation, and especially when they come back to the mom. There's a reunion. There's a love style. There's predictable paths. That will track for the rest of their life, barring intervention. The secure goes, man, I don't like them when mom leaves away, but when they come back, they get consoled, and they go back out and play with their toys. They're easily consoled. It's like, yeah, I knew mom was going to go away, but I know she's going to be there. The anxious could not be consoled. They would hit, there'd be a push-pull. They would be so angry they couldn't calm down, wouldn't go back out and play. And yet they would be, they were clinging, and yet they would sometimes hit mom. Mm. And then the avoidance were like, hmm, looks like mom left the room. I'll just continue to play. They look precociously mature, right? They might cry a little bit, but they're pretty much, and they just stay in the corner and they keep playing. (laughs) These will track. So I asked, at one year, you can have an attachment style. Whatever is telling that baby to be secure, that's the gold standard. Now, it doesn't take rocket science to realize it's not going to be uh, very sophisticated for a one-year-old. And I just start thinking, what's going on in a one-year-old brain? Well, the prefrontal cortex says, hi, I'm Lou. I have a story, limiting beliefs, abstract thought. All that good stuff, it doesn't come online until three. So there's none of that. And the hippocampus doesn't come on to 18 months. That's the part that does, you know, narrative story. The only thing that's online is the skeleton crew in the emotional field and what's called your amygdala and your your implicit memory. That has recorded narratives and, well, events and feelings about things that you cannot remember and will never remember. That's called implicit memory. And so I realized, oh my God, it's for it's feelings. It's feelings. Mm. The only thing running, which was a little bit of a surprise for me as a man. I thought we'd have a little more, you know, logic, but it's not. Doesn't mean stories and everything won't affect it later, but the core. And then I said, what are the real key questions? I mean, without feelings, I should say. And it turns out when you look at it through the lens of neo reiki and developmental psychology, there are predictable stages. And correlating with the the healing work of my clients, the first feeling a little baby is given is welcomed with joy. Hey, little little boy, so glad you came into the world, you know? Or you wake up in the morning and your spouse says, good morning, handsome, good morning, gorgeous. That's welcome with joy. Then there's worthy and nourished that, you know, a little bit later, the system said, well, you know, do, do, it, what, do I have needs? And what about those needs? Are they worthy to be met? And we know that when babies come out of the womb, those sensations of hunger and thirst, well, they didn't have them in the womb. And they don't even know what those mean. The mother literally teaches them, oh, that thing you're crying about, that's a need. And where the baby is learning whether those what it means to have needs and whether it's good to be able to cry and get your needs met or not. So it's okay later to reach out to a spouse. Mm-hmm. Then there's cherished and protected when the baby starts walking, realizes they're me, and now there's, but they know they're vulnerable. They need to be me in a we. And someone sees their essence, how valuable they are, and then protects them, cherished, protected. And it's not all me. And it's not all we. It's breathing, expanding. So you get to do your high wire act of your own aspirations as a couple individually and come back to the protective port of each other's heart. And then empowered with choice and voice comes on later. And when you get those four feelings, you have a secure love style. You feel loved and lovable. If you don't get those four, your brain will opt for anxious or avoidant, preoccupied, or dismissive. And then there are predictable patterns that show up in couples and in life in general. These rights, they create, these feelings create permission slips. And when you can see 
that the real key to reclaim is I have a right to, to feel safe, being welcomed and worthy and cherished and proud. That's what recovers. And when couples give and, and can monitor those feelings, that's when they have a great love. So the key is to recover in your body and your brain. It is, I have a right to feel worthy. I have a right to feel empowered and in a secure way, okay? And when you do that, this is the magic. Now, it's more complicated how I do that, but this is the main theory of how you reclaim secure love. And a lot of neuroscientists and therapists have said this is groundbreaking. Mm, 100%. I, and I love when you write, we, we have the experiences that we feel the, that we have the right to have. Exactly. You know, that's just profound. Uh, as I was sharing with uh, Dr. Gary before we went live, I just finished shooting two courses and, and, and they're online now. And that's the whole aspect of these courses is how do we access these beliefs that we're running that we don't even know we're running. We think we're consciously choosing them, but we're not. They're old programs that we play out um, and to realize, right? So I'm having an experience that I feel the right that I have. And that could be abundance or lack, right? Joy, fear. Uh, and so the essence of what he's getting at, right? This is how we then have our self identity and then interact in the world and attract the experiences with which we're running. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. All, all feelings are permission slips. If you think about it, emotion, mm -hmm. motivate comes from the same word. They are motivational states. And that means they're permission slips. If feelings had words, they don't. <clears throat> it's all coming from the right brain that doesn't lose language, right? If feelings had words, they'd only be saying two, generally speaking. Yes, no. Mm. So these feelings become what I call rights. You could call them permission slips. And those rights inevitably become cookie cutters <clears throat> for experience. <clears throat> we keep creating the same thing over and over again, like Groundhog Day. So these feelings literally tell our brain what we can or cannot have, create, choose. And you're right. We will, we are always having the experience that we have the rights for that. And that gets down to, we could also say safe. Uh, so it's, it's about putting these feelings back in the brain. And it's like, you know, putting things on the menu that weren't there or they were taken off actually. Mm. So we, and the menu and its feelings. If you're a man out there listening, yes, we're going to have to get you into your body and feelings <laughs> because this is the heart and soul of what you were, you have a birthright for and for your relationships. So let's, uh, let, let's take it to the, the top of the food chain again. <clears throat> how does the brain create the experiences? Like how does it create, record, uh, you know, so a little bit of neurology, but for the layperson. Okay. Wow. You have asked a whole dissertation <laughs> question, my friend. Man, did you like go big picture or what? You know. So how does the brain create experience? I could I could go for a whole book on this. So let me give you one snippet of how it, it happens. Your brain is receiving um 50, the brainstem is receiving 50 to 60 million bits of information a second. Now, that's this is super fast, and it's picking up from body and brain in your brainstem. And as you go further up into the cortical brain, the more advanced levels, um, this much inform information is overwhelming. By the time you get to the prefrontal cortex, it is dealing with anywhere from a, a hundred and you know twenty eight bits per uh, second to I've heard as little as six, but somewhere around one hundred and twenty eight. Okay, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. That's considerably less than fifty to sixty million. Which one would you rather have in your bank account? <laughs> right now, you got to think about you know. Your brain, in order to survive, has to delete a lot from the conscious mind. 
Okay, it has to, and then from this very specific generalization, right, then it creates reality. Now, the brain comes in at birth, you know, with about five times more neurons than you'll have as an adult. And it is literally being wired how to create by experience. What this means is what well, those early feelings are going into the amygdala. Is it safe to reach out, have my needs or not? Can I speak my truth or not? Can I cry? Do, you know, you know, do I'm empowered with choice? All these feelings. And whatever feeling is put in there tells the brain what to look out for. Now, there's already a negative bias to the brain. Three quarters of the amygdala of the neurons are dedicated for looking for danger. Mm. What's out there? Okay. So you're fighting evolution because at one point in time back in the, you know, just think of Jurassic Park. You know, if you're, if you were back there 65 million years ago, that's when this part was really being wired, the amygdala, you know, it's advanced some since then, but it's, it's pretty scary. So you get that and you get your own personal experience and suddenly reality is being filtered and flavored by that by whatever experience negative or positively and when you get to the prefrontal i mean the cortical brain this is really interesting you have in these you have columns and there's six neurons in each two are always coming from what's coming in outside that's the present two are going back to implicit memory that you can't, it's memory you can't remember, but you'll never forget, <laughs> right? And reading whatever perceptual bias all those feelings into. So there's never a time you're reading reality. It is biological and possible to read reality as it is. And then you've got two neurons that put it together. And there is a bias toward what happened. Now, sometimes that's procedural memory. So you remember how to walk. Uh, the other good thing about implicit memory, you walk into a bathroom and you see that 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 bowl of water. And some part remembers, oh, we don't drink from that. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> you know, but I want you to get the feeling that whatever feelings, whatever flavor of safety is enormously, enormously impacting what you allow in perceptually, what you delete, creating an echo chamber of past experience with the small, you know, making sure that we project our past onto the future, unless we're, we get to be in our wise selves, that it's a hollow deck <laughs> created by childhood or maybe last, you know, past experience. If you want to know our brain creates experience, that's it. And then these feelings are being filtered for, and then we, and then this part begins to make up limiting beliefs to explain it. Explain tertiary at best third level if i want to get rid of the path you know it is not the root cause anybody working with uh, beliefs out there sorry the feelings are determining beliefs if you don't change the feelings you will not change the beliefs if you change the belief it will come in and sideways as another limiting belief and then you get stories this part comes on at three creates a long-winded limiting belief called you guessed it your personal story and then your story creates an identity and identity and story tell you what tell your brain what more experience to create and now we've got a real cycle so we've got to change the early feelings we've got to do that first and then we change we have to change identity and we have to change story because this is the backup system for this and when we change and so real change is swapping out safety and, and those bad feelings are unwelcome, unworthy, uncherished, and disempowered. And then we eventually, we you never do this. You never swap out a story first. You swap out the feelings that drive it, get the safety, and then you swap out identity. Then you can add skills for love or whatever you're doing. If you, That's the short version. So if any of you think, I am and I'm being limited, no, that's just an old feeling. You have far more power, but it does take deep work and it and it doesn't happen on a three-day weekend just because a guru is doing a couple of chapters with you.
<laughs> on the other hand, it doesn't have to take a lifetime. And right. It, it, you know, somewhere yeah. in the middle. <laughs> So, so thank you for that succinct description and explanation of that process. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, definitely hit rewind and listen to that again, because it's packed full of information, yet it was succinctly described. Uh, and before I started doing the work of, so my delusion was, since I was perceiving reality, uh, therefore everybody else was perceiving what i was perceiving right hence my frustration and my communications with people because what right like how can you not see that um mm -hmm. not realizing what you just described is i'm not seeing actuality i'm seeing reality which is only in my cranium which is now enmeshed with everything you just described my experiences, yeah. the encoding, my perceptions and culture and uh, up and all of that in the mixed pile is what I'm now perceiving as reality. Uh, and, you know, when I finally became aware of that, I'm like, oh, oh, reality is only in my cranium as it is yours and yours and yours. And they're all different because of what Dr. Gary just described. Um, exactly. You know, and, and this is why my favorite line in the book, I have a personal favorite line in the book. <laughs> It, whatever events, whatever feelings back there have been at the root cause of the This is what I say. No event and no person should ever be given the power to control mm. your entire incarnation. Mm. Now, people invent, create the feelings, right? But if we allow, if, you know, like I had a borderline mother, I talked about that, right? Uh, and she, at four, she was like, you know, and like if we moved, you know, the sun to, you know, a million miles away, she was like all over the heavens, right? And as well, she should have been. But I should not let that sort of chaotic, violent behavior, it did not have to create the rest of my there came a day where you know we were born to feel empowered mm. we were born to feel worthy of real love and life and it's reclaiming that and you and you do have the innate power all these feelings of empowered oh i can change it or i'm worthy to change it those are the two feelings you really need to start the ball changing your brain when it takes them offline, puts them, it says, well, things aren't safe. Let's put them in a layaway plan for the day it is safe. But the problem is it's in a part of the brain that doesn't do time. And so there's no expiration for this, for this layaway plan. It's like, you know, you know, back when they used to do layaway plans, they don't do that anymore. You could put it in May, but it's, and it's like, it's going on 40 years later. <laughs> Take it out of layaway. Now, First, you might have to reclaim the feeling of empowered or worthy. For me, when I was four, if I had been worthy to speak my truth to a borderline, I may not have been alive right now. In fact, I guarantee you I wouldn't because she was violent. That was a good move then. Best deal available. No limiting belief, no limiting pattern, no limiting you know, feeling ever you know, came about because some brain said, hey, I wonder how I can screw with my master today. No, no brain gets up there. Takes the best deal available. So if you get crappier, crappier, it'll take crappy. It's going back and working with that timeless now. So it feels like now and everything, and you don't even know those feelings are bleeding in. It just feels like, oh, here we go again. And is it? Is it really? Some part, yes, choosing it. Some part, prodding it. Some part, picking it. Yes, that gets to be the little dicey part when you're working with clients and couples, and now reclaiming it so it's safe to mm. feed and mm. power. That's the key. Safe for all these feelings. Finding that exact flavor is the key to the deep work. That's why it's called safe to love again, not guilt trip, not inspired. <laughs> <laughs> 100%, right? Because without the safety, it's the, it's not going to happen. I will not let myself go down that road. Uh, I was just reflecting on a couple clients when you were describing that, who, uh, as we were working, you know, accessing through their system, 
the what they learned as a, a protective defense mechanism was don't show my feelings because when I do, you know, the retaliation is not worth it. So I'm going to learn to contain all those. And now as adults, they've contained them so much that the body's imploding, uh, right? So they don't release any anger and they carry it, store it. Hence, it's no longer emotion or any energy emotion. It's now locked as potential instead of kinetic emotion. Uh, and, you know, and then the body starts doing its thing, right? So kidney stones, you know, repressed and I'm right? like, you know, get pissed off, right? So you can move that through, like do it, move the energy. Uh, but do it in a way that's safe so you can allow yourself to know that it's okay to do this and retrain the system that it's safe to let this out and it's safe to feel it, right? Yeah, exactly. um, in, in part of Reich's brilliance, of, he had some weird stuff back there. He was Freud's student, was he began to notice that all this emotion and energy and this patterning will be encoded in the body as as muscular protection. Now, I think it's also cellular if you go reading Bruce Lipton, but he was we weren't there yet. But he began to know that you can sense the protective patterning and the energy in the body. He called it bioenergetics. We are not installed, we are embodied. And like for instance, you know, have you ever seen someone who just is really uptight? And their jaws and they got big thick yeah, often goes to the missing right to assert it's like tmj right guess who you know i couldn't assert when i was a four-year-old and then at 28 i go to a chiropractor and guess what i've got tmj uh, and, and the worst side was always on this side where she would hit me with her right hand <laughs> right and 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 it was like oh my god <laughs> four-year-old the body remembers it as Vessel von der Kolf says the body keeps score. So, mm. it's, I mean, when we are working, it's a whole bodied expression. I mean, you well know this. Uh, it's releasing the body based places uh, that we store that old energy. In fact, 80%. And another way we create experience, if we want to add the body now, is there's this communication top down. And we think it's all going this way. Right. But 20 percent of the signals are going down to the body. 80 percent are coming up. And if we have in place these old bioenergetic signatures in our body and 80 percent is coming back up, usually the form of safety or not safety. Right. Now we've got a real echo chamber. So we have to clear up the stuff in the body because it becomes a re reinforcement loop with this. This puts and that it's almost a microphone or, or megaphone so because i know you do a lot of this type of work there's a somatic element although i think when people do somatic it's you can't do it just somatically this part has you know beliefs and identity and like we just talked and filters and it, it's got to be a, a fully embodied i just did an online course too and in every uh, module, I start off with an, uh, an, an embodied piece, a somatic piece. And then at the end, I do something for up here, both balanced, right? I mean, one of the reasons I like EFT, it's a beautiful way of re releasing that, right? That past pain, right? So that is stored here, all right? And I, so, you know, if you, that's another way we create experience. And, uh, then what I'm thankful for, we have beautiful people like you who, who are just Jedi masters of that. <laughs> so, thank you. And so one of the things that Dr. Gary, or the whole conversation so far, so in the very beginning when he was talking about when a child's one and, and the experiences they're having and fight or flight. So that's a part of the nerve system, right? That keeps us in stress because it's survival and protection, right? Hence the words fight or flight fight to survive or flight, run away to survive. And when that's encoded in the system, then that's what's running as the default pattern, which is why people are walking around completely stressed, but it's the norm for them. It's not normal, but it's the norm. And they think that's just how I am, right? Uh, and so one of the, so I'm speaking to listening audience, one of the, one of the pieces that I love sharing so much is the quickest way to intervene is breath. Exactly. Because how we breathe informs back to the root are we safe or not and and our most people's basic breathing mechanism keeps them in fight or flight 
when they learn to just do some gentle changes in breath style to volitionally access, now it starts to inform down to the cellular level that I, I am safe. And, and that starts shifting the entire process. And people think, well, I know how to breathe, right? Because they're inhaling and exhaling from a biological process. I'm like, no, you don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And so, right, so there's these huge gifts that we can start incorporating self to start engaging in that process, right? Yeah, and those are all just protective places that mm. the brain is coded. I like there's fight and flight, but we, you might want to add in fawn and freeze. You know, freeze is when you really think you're dead. But the fawn, if you're a you know, fight and flight came from Cannon's research in the 40s. And uh, you know, uh what's the autonomic system doing? Fight and flight. Now, if you're a woman listening to this, you might like this. And and he was certain that we don't want to taint the um, some female researchers in the 90s, early 2000s said, let's go look at that original. And we found out that in order to remain unbiased, that Cannon said we couldn't have female humans and we couldn't have female rats either because we wouldn't want to bias the sample. And some of the female researchers thought, hmm, I wonder if we have a bias there. <laughs> And what they found out is fight and flight, yes, everybody does, but female rats, not that women uh, are the only ones, men can do this too, but there's a third response when you introduce female rats and females, fawn, fawn. Oh my God, how do I fix this? Oh, let me make, I'm so sorry I said that to you, honey, it was all my fault, let me make sure it's a fawn. You could also call it fix, fawn is also being so smart, overgiving that is just that's also there with fight and flight right <clears throat> and so i i think that's a, a it's mm. good to realize people say well that's not exactly my experience no but i'll bet fawn or you know maybe it's freeze if it's really bad right but i'll bet you fawn is the un is the is the dark horse that we often we didn't really get a chance mm. to how many nice. times does do the anxious try to fix and manage that's you know does that make sense? Or uh, how do I, you know, men try to fix too. They don't know how to feel their feelings. Then maybe they don't go and fight or flight, but they, well, honey, you know, I know you're upset, but let's see if we can logically deal with that. Beautiful. Thank you. So yeah. uh, tagging on to that, uh, something that is, uh, especially the last, well, geez, long time, but especially the last many years, um, trust is at a very low level. Uh, threshold, right? Um, what are some of the steps that the listening audience can take to start to engage in the process of, uh, even if it's not betrayal, coming out of non-trust states, getting into trust states, right? So what practices, what action steps can people start to reclaim trust? Okay, a couple of things. There is a science to trust, by the way. Uh, John Gottman had a book, it's heavy duty, it's about yay thick, called The Science of Trust. The the more layman's version, I believe, is the, uh, he does a, a good job of explaining it and called something called the relationship cure. Trust is a track record, as I said. Mm. What's the, the core metric for trust is can in relation at least <clears throat> right can i trust expect that you will not seek your interest <clears throat> at my cost will you leverage your interest at my expense will you seek a win at my loss when we know they will our partner the person we're dealing with <clears throat> will not sacrifice our needs, but they cherish and protect our needs. This is where I'm going to just wet it in with my own theory. When you feel cherished and protected, you know they're not going to, to uh, leverage. They're going to they're going to seek a win-win. They're as interested in your needs as theirs. When you feel that, that mm. trust. Now, surely there's some other things, and it's a track record. How come, how, do you trust gravity? Well, <laughs> you ever, you know, <laughs> it's always been there. Yes, know? sir. Right. You know, I mean, maybe if you're off falling off a 20 foot, you know, story building, you may not trust it in that moment, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's what's bringing you back. <laughs> right. 
But relationally, trust is a track record. And when trust gets broken, that's a whole other, you know, there's got to be atonement and attunement and then attachment, right? But it's that feeling that I'm being cherished and protected in a we that is valuing my interest. Um, and it's, and we talk about betrayal like it's always sexual. It could be financial. It could be emotional. It could be all sorts of things. Interest. So, and, you know, one of the ways, when people have had a lot of shattered experience uh, with trust, you know, uh, some part starts deleting the ways I am being supported, the ways mm. that is supporting me. Uh, I mean, so right at the moment, just think about um, how many people that you're not thinking have actively supported you. Mm. Did somebody bring the group? Did some farmer grow that that avocado? Did somebody at the store sell it to you? Did the trash people come by this week? Did you go to? Did you get a doctor's appointment? You know, and then you start noticing. Oh, how many people were there for me? You know, I might have had a mother that I had to constantly watch. It was not safe. But I had some beautiful people like my third grade teacher, Mrs. Graham, who showed me, oh, my God, this is this is a woman. I don't I don't get this. She's actually got my back. And she was the safest person. Mrs. Graham, my third grade teacher, saved my incarnation. And um, it's probably not an accident that, you know, uh, even afterwards, even through high school, I knew where she lived. And I would come back and, in the summers and have Kool-Aid with Mrs. Graham. Mm. <laughs> Lemonade, actually, with Mrs. Graham. Thelma was a, <laughs> a really beautiful soul, right? Um, and, you know, all those circles of support, the poets, the guides, and all those people that have served up, right? And then your inner circle. You can include, if Brene Brown has supported you, then put Brene, even if you never met, or your best friends, and then just notice you've got any spiritual. I'll bet you've deleted a lot of ways that you have learned and it's just noticing that right now, gravity, chair, you know, and the we that is supporting. Right now, I had a beautiful soul reach out and ask me to be on his podcast. Mm. You know, uh, if you start noticing that, it doesn't mean that, you know, if you're going through an affair and your partner affair and your world will blow up. Oh, my God. It's like you're it's like how a line man. Uh, 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 a, a landmine going off on the road, all the rules when betrayal of that you thought you could depend on. Yes, that happened. But you can start by taking in there. And then if it's feeding into the past, if that sort of betrayal, then we have to rework that. That's claimable. Uh, there's, no, you know, there is no place in the world that we can guarantee that crap won't happen. Mm -hmm. There's random nuttiness in this world, right? Um, but, so there's no absolute trust. There's no absolute, I should say, certainty. But you don't need abs absolute certainty unless you're extremely avoidant, and I'm extremely anxious, right? But you can calm your nervous system down that that's background noise, and you can learn to trust and learn the signals. When you're dealing with four feelings, you'll pick up the signals of whether someone's cherishing and protecting you or not. And that's your first clue. Am I cherished that they value me enough they're not going to betray me, right? They are, I'm worthy to have my needs met. But it's more cherished and protected. When you're picking up that, it's going to be pretty trustworthy. And by the way, that is the feeling that creates a we. And a we is all about trust, creating mm. dependence. It's the lifeblood of a we. Um, and when people don't create a we, it's because they're either afraid it's going to go away, a.k.a. the anxious and the preoccupied, or they're going to lose their sense of empowerment, or whatever they're going to lose. They can't. That's they. It's not worthy to be depended on. Show me a couple that cannot trust dependency one way or the other, and I'll show you a couple that's in distress. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so my perception of, of a part of what Gary just said, which was um, when we have an experience where trust has been tainted, violated, shattered, the pain, my experience, causes us to go tunnel vision 
uh, as he was saying, so we delete all that's still around us that's still good and supported. And by that tunnel vision, then we keep attracting more of what we don't want, which is evidence of the inability to trust or betrayal. And the yeah. gift of what he just shared was, boom, get out of the tunnel vision by going big again of noticing life, right? Simply, when you walk, does the earth move away from you, right? No, right? The earth is still there. That means you can trust the earth is going to be under your feet. Uh, you know, the chair you're sitting on, right? All the things you just went through, right? So brilliant piece of, hey, like, what can I do? Well, come out of the tunnel vision, open up the field of view, if you will, and notice where you have evidence, right? Evidence of support in your life. Oh, and then you can slide back into choose to trust that again and go, oh, well, let me focus on that. Meaning, what are you focusing on? Exactly. And, you, and it's one thing, like, for instance, and it's also knowing, being aware from your higher self, how when you've experienced betrayal, you will have protector parts. And the funny thing about protector parts, whether they come from trauma or abuse, whether that they tend, they're, when the brain cannot be in connection with one, there's protection mode going on. That's neuroscience. Those protector parts, and this is where real consciousness comes from, can abuse the next person. The next pays for the X. My only, I, well, let's put it this way. A long time ago, I got, I had betrayal, sexual betrayal from a very significant relationship. Okay. That affair just messed with me. Right. And, um, and when I walked out, some part of my brain says, well, we don't want to ever have that. And so it starts looking out for it. And then there's this generalization, right? That my therapist is taking some exception to when I'm saying all women. <laughs> and she would say some women. <laughs> some women and eventually now she got it cognitively because after about four months i said some woman she goes hallelujah but deep down inside there is still a part going i'm gonna look out for that protection good good for back then but not so good now and i can still remember when i became you know about three four years later i, I walked into a pretty significant relationship and she's a beautiful soul she really is a very monogamous woman, right? And I walk in and I see a plumber working on her. And man, the protector part comes out. I pop an attitude like you wouldn't believe the plumber leaves. And this little five foot one looks at, and she gets to be me because she goes, look here, young Dr. Sire. <laughs> she was about five years older than me, right? And I, she goes, I don't deserve this crap. I have never cheated on anybody and I don't deserve to pay for this person's, you know, she goes, this is harmful and hurtful for us. I don't deserve this. It's also good to know how there's filters and those protections and now every filter has a protector part, <laughs> right? Are not showing up to create love for another person. This is consciousness. It's not just about protecting me. We got to get those protector parts that we all have to protect those we love. Mm. And a lot of people would look at trauma. I got my protector parts and they don't realize that the trauma is creating abuse for other people. That's the bitter peel and trauma that, and, and I had to look and I looked at her and I said, you're right. Mm. You don't deserve this. And, you know, that was, now, that's another level that we don't hear so much in therapy. We work so much on the trauma and healing and the individual. We don't get that it is creating unrelational patterns that do not feel good for other people. And when you're in your higher self, there has to be a part. And part of all this growth is having a degree of separation from your pain. You can change nothing when you're in the pain. Okay, If your car stops and you can't move it, can you push it from inside? No, you got to get outside. You have to have that one degree of separation. That one degree of separation, if we connect it to our higher self in whatever way you assume it, your best self on your best day or your higher self or your soul, whatever you want to, 
now this is where real power comes to change as well there's real empowerment there because it's not in pain but it can see the pain and when we can look at that then we can look at ourselves with relational honesty because i had to realize that some of my protector parts were not so cool the first time that dawned on me was five years into my first marriage and my mom you know, I got so tired of the lies in that family that I had allergic response to lies. I just mm -hmm. knew I was lying. So I became honest. I read some book, you know, The Miracle of Dialogue. And, and, and with, but with that, I had filtered it through some family lens I didn't realize. And I, I would always say, I'm being brutally honest here. Mm -hmm. And one day she looked at me, she goes, after I shared something, she goes, I said, I'm just being brutally honest here. And she goes, if you just take the <laughs> you've got what you just said. Oh. That part that said, I will never be lied again, I will never lie again, was it had been unconsciously filtered through, and I didn't realize the perpetrator side of my family. <laughs> didn't realize. You, your brain has got to pick up some of that stuff. And there's all sorts of little ways that when we are insecure, we have to look at our stuff and there will be some moments of, wow, I'm empowered. And there will be some points when you deal with your protector's heart, there's a dark side. You have to have the honesty to say, to look at yourself, but with great rapport. I didn't pick that up to hurt anybody. I picked it up to protect you. So you're, you have to do it with empathy for yourself, the little one, but also for the people that are with you. This is where I think trauma therapy all often goes astray. It's so focused on the me, it's not really focusing on how that is going elsewhere in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so th if you really want, when you're the way back, sometimes, you know, you have to realize my brain took the best deal, but it's not a best deal for me and it's sure ain't a good deal for others. This is the honest side of love, but you mm -hmm. do it with love. You, you don't judge the crap out of yourself, but you you do take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what Terry Real would call fierce intimacy with yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't judge that kid. I simply say to him from a higher self, I'll speak for you now. Mm -hmm. With my wisdom, I will have wise honesty. No, but I want to yeah. say exactly. No, yeah. we're not in the 19. You know, I will speak for you. <laughs> and sometimes I have a mouthy eight-year-old, and, and I have to make sure that the mouthy eight-year-old <laughs> doesn't get the vocal cords. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that 100%. Is part, uh, and this is how I, I not only reclaim the right, but I have to give it. Mm. I have to give those four feelings to everybody I meet. No one's going to be perfect. And so this is the part I don't. It's mostly centered. On, it's 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 a way of life. We create a we with everybody to some little tiny extent. You know, even at Starbucks, you can say to the you can welcome them with joy by going, Hi Lou, can I get a, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, one of those acai, acai berry, you know, things with no ice, right? That's my favorite, you know. So it, that too. We want to put not just the brain, but the higher self. There's a that's why I have a chapter nine in the book on higher self and how that helps us because there is a spiritual dimension. This, however, you define it. Oh, it's in, and even Richard Schwartz, you know, trauma therapist and uh, internal family system. He talks about higher self. I've talked to him personally when I've trained with him. It's a spiritual process for, for Richard. <laughs> you know, Dick Schwartz says knows that. It's embedded, that wise self. So, but that's, we were born to have that access. And I think it's our fail safe. When things, no matter what happened in childhood, no how bad, this side can always balance it out. That's how I came back from a pretty abusive background. This side can always balance it out. There's mm. more resources available. Always. Always. Yeah. Woo! 
Oh, boy. So, ladies and gentlemen, just to, uh, so it looks like there's going to be a, a round three and a round four and a round five for uh, Dr. Gary's return, because I just looked down and realized I didn't get one third of the topics <laughs> I wanted to um, pack with him. Um, so, first of all, super grateful for your time, sir. Secondly, um, and I, so if, I don't mean to open this up if it's not there yet. The five day is that coming up five day challenge is that something we should let people know about or or just go to the site connect with dr gary one he just gave me an insight to his uh online course that's in production the or it's been shot but now it's being edited and all this yummy stuff and oh my goodness the modules that he just expressed to me which i'm looking forward to accessing as soon as it comes out uh, but he's also um and so i don't know if i'm letting the cat out of the bag no, no, no. It's it's the called the five day or yeah. This five day challenge. I don't know what we're naming. I'm I'm literally going to be working with a Hollywood director that's worked with me and just wants to promote my 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 work. So I'm getting I'm getting something really cool. I mean, this is going to be way beyond even the filming of the five day challenge, which was done professionally. This is like way. I mean, this is HBO quality stuff. I don't know what the name of that thing is yet. And in fact, I'm just setting down to create it. And I know it wants to lead in to the online course and maybe mm -hmm. even retreats. It's you know I'm trying to open up my work to a greater wider variety of people so that more people can benefit than just one-on-one -on -one. um but that that i'm going to film and i believe in in the first week in december so somewhere in the spring or so you know i'm hoping to get the course out and the five-day challenge leading into it singles i was going to do one for singles and, and couples but you know that's the guy that wrote a 555 page dissertation and 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 we've decided i was talking to him yesterday because let's just, it's better to do one we're going to do one in one you know it's a one day shoot you know uh and you know five day challenge isn't as long as you know what 10 15 minute modules five so it's a much shorter window um uh but it's coming out probably in the spring you know awesome awesome and so in the meantime, reach out to Dr. Gary. I'll have the link in the show notes. Um, he, he's got some beautiful free resources on the site. Uh, definitely get the book and dive into that. Um, and then you'll you'll see more opportunity to connect with him there and get into his world and definitely get on, on the, the wait list notification of the course when it comes out and definitely the five day challenge for sure. Yeah, um, you go to the website on the first page, the landing page, there's a little thing like I think it says love inspirations. You get a free gift, Dr. Gary's Guide to Lasting Love. You get to s s choose three versions of it. One, if you're single, not dating, single, dating, can't find, get, you know, get past the hamster wheel, the wrong one, or for couples, you know, who are like, oh, here we go again. So if you get on that, you'll get it on the man. And I give really cool support letters and, you know, every week, right? So, and then you'll know when all this stuff comes out, because right now yeah. I'm in the middle of creation. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that uh, for sure. Yeah. And same, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the uh, the conscious languaging, my courses were just put out. So I'll have a link under there as well, because that's a huge, impactful tool to keep unpacking what we the conversation we just had. Um, so. Dr. Gary, thank you for your time and your presence. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with me and the listening audience. Uh, and for everybody listening, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Dow Living Podcast. Share this with everyone you know so they too can tap into and start altering the concept of why is this happening to me again? Abundant blessings. Until next time, ciao. To connect further and dive deeper, you can always reach me at my website, lucorletto.com l-o-u-c-o-r-l-e-t-o -E or in the social channels facebook lucorletto.official instagram lu underscore corletto twitter lu underscore corletto and linkedin until next time remember who you be abundant blessings <laughs>